Good morning, and it's great to be with you all again. But what a powerful video that just was. Have you ever felt that way, being kicked to the mud and really struggling to get out of that place? Sadly, for a lot of people, it becomes quite a familiar place where we define that as normal. Oh, well, that's just the way it's going to be. But the latter part of that video shows us otherwise. But here's the truth based on what we just watched. The devil wants to remind you of the worst parts of you so that he can keep you from the best parts of God. That's just so typical of what the enemy of your soul wants to do to your life. Keep you in the mud. Keep you buried in the dark, cold mud. And for you to get to a point where you think, you know what? Nothing will ever change. I guess this is the way life will always be. And perhaps I'm telling some of your stories. Maybe you know this feeling all too well. You're trying to move forward, yet you get kicked down again. You're trying to move into the ways of God and you're trying to live a life connected to God. But there's something, it's like an invisible cord or a, or a chain that's holding you back to the past of who you were. Now, for each one of us, it could be something completely different that's doing that. It could be a, a past mistake or an ongoing habit that you just can't seem to kick it could be a sin, a failure, whatever it is. It's a, an invisible thing holding you back from rising up out of the mud. For some, it can also be a past traumatic experience or a devastating disappointment. You see, you need to know that Satan, the enemy of your soul, wants to keep you locked in your past because he knows what happens to free people. He knows what happens when people live free and they latch onto the destiny to which God has set upon every single life. Now, if it's up to Satan, he will keep you down. He will keep you in the cold mud, holding you back from true lasting freedom. And I've seen this time and time again, where someone's past or even someone's own view of themselves cripples them. It literally cripples them. They can't see anything beyond that crippling feeling. And, the, and why that occurs is because these past experiences have latched onto your identity. There was a dearly um, loved friend of ours, elderly lady that Kaz and I had the privilege of seeing her come to saving faith in Jesus. And then we discipled her in her newfound walk with Christ. This was while we were living in Puerto Rico. She was such a dear friend. Marion was her name. She had a Jewish background. And when she got saved, I remember this so clearly. She said, Mark, my biggest regret is that it has taking, taken me 70 years to find Jesus. My biggest regret is that it has taken me 70 years to find Jesus. And she went on to share with us that the shame of her past convinced her that she deserved nothing more than guilt, disgrace, humiliation and misery. She didn't get into a lot of detail about what that past was. But that past locked her in for 70 years until she finally got free. And when she became a dedicated follower of Jesus, it was like in that video, she ran in the open fields with Christ and now more than ever, she's not with us anymore. But now she's walking through the fields of gold with Jesus himself. And that's what I'm going after today. I'm going after our freedom. I'm going after the heart of who we are. Because I want to go head on against a silent killer. A silent killer that we're all familiar with, whether you're a Christian or not. This silent killer wants to cause us to live way below what Jesus has made available. This silent killer is stealing from some of you right now. This silent killer is whispering lies to you and it's easy to believe those lies because they sound true. They sound so familiar. This silent killer is telling you that you don't deserve any better that you're unworthy of God and that you might as well accept it, life doesn't get any better than this. This silent killer I have found to be a common trait in what causes people to keep on falling into the same pattern of sin 
into the same habits, into the same old familiar way of life. Today, I'm exposing the silent killer called shame. Shame. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's very obvious, but shame is a tool, a very well-used tool of Satan and his demons to keep you and me and all of humanity distant from the fullness of grace, distant from living in our calling that God has put on our lives. Shame is revealed when someone can't seem to overcome their history of abuse and trauma. It's like they're chained to their past of humiliation, guilt and embarrassment. Shame is revealed when someone just can't move forward from their own self-imposed prison that they feel dirty. You know, they feel unworthy, they feel disgraceful because of certain choices that they've made. Shame is also revealed when words that have been spoken over you, that as I said earlier, they sound true, but they chain you and lock you into feeling worthless, hopeless and disgraceful. Shame lies to you and tells you that you are undeserving. You're undeserving of God's best. You're undeserving of God's love, forgiveness or whatever it may be. I've met so many people where shame has locked them in a prison. A prison away from God's best, from God's grace. I remember a friend of mine once said, talking about God and, and surrendering your life to Jesus. He says, Mark, I can't because I feel so bad for what I've done in the past. He went on to describe, he says, Mark, if, if you knew what I did, you would agree with me that God would not forgive me. And my heart broke because it was such a narrow view of the magnitude of God's love and grace and mercy. I mean, really, is God's love like ours where sometimes it's conditional? <laughs> is God's love so limited that he would turn away a person who comes to him needing and wanting loving mercy, grace and freedom? Is God a mean-hearted judge waiting for you to be good enough? Waiting for you to get your stuff together before you come to him? No. If that is your version of God, dear friend, you have been lied to. If that is how you see God, that you are unreachable, that you are undeserving, that you are one in all of the world, you are the one that God cannot possibly forgive because of what you've done. Shame has lied to you if that's how you think of God. Shame is very powerful. It can define your reality and define the way you see yourself. One such person in the Bible that I want to share his story with you now Understand, understood what shame does to a person and how shame keeps someone from the very best of what God has for him. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, there's a man named Mephibosheth. <laughs> there's a good one for you. Parents, if you're going to have any more children, think about that name, Mephibosheth. It's a very heart-wrenching story, but it comes to a point in his life where his shame collides with the goodness and the kindness of God. Let me set the scene for you. Here is King David, the greatest king Israel would ever have. And the king now is David, and before him was King Saul. And Saul had a son named Jonathan. Now Jonathan and David were so close, they were literally like brothers. They loved each other like brothers. But let me take it up with you now from 2 Samuel chapter 9. You see, King Saul had died and Jonathan had also died on the battlefield. And now David was king. This moment is beautiful as it reflects the heart of God for you and I. But I've got the scripture on the screen for you. Let's read it together. One day David asked, Is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And he summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. 
Are you Ziba? The king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, Is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replied, Yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. In Lodabar, Ziba told him, at the home of Machia, son of Amiel. So David sent for him and brought him from Machia's home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, Greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And, I love this bit, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? It's such a beautiful moment, yet it's also tinged with sadness. This moment filled with godlike kindness, godlike generosity, a moment filled with honor, respect, and gracious redemption from King David. But amazing and as glorious as that moment was, and as inspiring as the kindness that David searched to pour out upon a member of his dearly loved friend's family. At this point in the story, shame rose to the surface. Look at again at Mephibosheth's words after David had extended kindness to him. In verse 8, he said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? That's how it renders that verse in the New King James Version. You should look upon such a dead dog as I. Why did he see himself that way? Why? Because his past defined how he saw himself and what he thought he deserved. Let me tell you a little bit about Mephibosheth. When he was five years old, the word tells us, he and his nurse were running for their lives after the death of Saul and Jonathan at a battle at um, Jezreel. Now, as she was carrying Mephibosheth, he, he fell and he became lame and crippled in both of his feet from that moment on. It was that trauma that now defined this man. Get this, his crippled legs also crippled his identity. His crippled legs also crippled his identity. I can picture Mephibosheth in his local village being known as the cripple. I can imagine kids teasing him as he was growing up that he can't walk and run with them. He can't do what the other children could do. You see, humanity can be quite mean to people struggling with a disability. Look at this. Shame cripples you from seeing yourself as God sees you. Mephibosheth's disability was seen by his society as a curse. You see, that's how they perceived anyone struggling with a, with, a, with a deformation or whatever it is, that they are cursed. Obviously, they've done something wrong because look at what God has done to that individual. Not only did people around Mephibosheth believe that, but he believed it himself and it crippled him from seeing himself the way God did. Thankfully, this story gets better. Let's take it up from verse 9. Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba replied, Yes, my lord, the king. I am your servant, and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, 
Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. From then on, all the members of Ziba's household were Mephibosheth's servants. And Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. This is such like the story of the pauper becoming a prince, isn't it? And this is now Mephibosheth's reality. Isolated in some dead-end town somewhere, removed, hidden, and now brought into royalty to sit at the king's table. Look at, look at the last verse of that um, piece of scripture again. Verse 13, Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem, the king's city, and ate regularly at the king's table. From a pauper to a prince. Don't miss this. Because this is such an important a moment in Mephibosheth's life, but also something that you and I can learn from today. Look at this. No matter how shameful you feel or how crippled you are by your past, when you're at the king's table, your brokenness is hidden under his kindness. Think about what I'm getting to here. Mephibosheth would have had to have been carried into the king's presence. His legs were lame. They didn't work anymore. But when Mephibosheth was seated at the king's table, do you see his lameness? Do you see his disability? Do you see his crippled legs? No, because they are covered by the goodness and the kindness of the king. Holy Spirit has brought us into the king's throne room. Because in the presence of the king, his goodness, his kindness covers us. All of our brokenness, all of your brokenness, get this, is covered by his kind grace. It's a very inspiring story. But don't miss the parallel between what David did to Mephibosheth and what Jesus has done for us. You see, scholars have said that King David is a Christ-like figure in the Old Testament. There are characteristics in David's life that we can um, see reflected in the life of Jesus as well. But the King of Heaven, the King of Heaven has also searched us out, just as King David searched out Mephibosheth. And the King of Heaven has invited you into his presence, has invited you to sit at his table, that he may pour out goodness upon you, Yes, you might feel undeserving. You might feel that you are a cripple. Life has crippled you. Life has just thrown you in the mud of shame time and time again. You might feel dirty. You might feel disgraceful, humiliated, embarrassed. But the king has searched you out. The king has chosen to bring you into his presence and giving, given you a seat at the royal table where only family is allowed to sit. Oh, it's breathtaking. You are now at his royal table. The king of all the creation has turned to you and brought you in on all the beauty and the wonder of what he has and who he is. The table where the Father, Son and Holy Spirit sit, united in love, connected in harmonious relationship. We call this the relationship of the Trinity, the triune nature of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in perfect unity. And this table of fellowship is reserved only for the royalty of heaven. And he's invited you. He has invited you no matter how you feel about yourself, to sit with him. There's oh. <laughs> something I have to show you here. There's a famous painting titled The Trinity, and it tries to portray this relationship in a very ancient way, what the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, how they interconnect and, in, and are united together. 
It's a painting painted by an, a Russian artist by, called, what's his name? Andrei Rublev. And this painting was painted in the year 1425. Now, many of you have heard me speak and refer to this painting before when I preached a message on the word perichoresis or perichoresis. I don't have time to get into that right now. And if you want to dig into this, this topic a little bit further, it's a message titled Reflecting Heaven's Unity. We have it on our website. But there's, in this painting, there's something so beautiful that I want to highlight to you and show you how this relates to Mephibosheth's story and also your story. This is the painting that I'm talking about. The Trinity by Andrei Rublev, painted in 1425. There is the Father on the left, the Son, Jesus, in the middle, and the Holy Spirit on the right-hand side of that painting. Now, this is Andrei Rublev's attempt at painting the Trinity, interacting, flowing in one. Though each having their own unique attributes, it's still altogether one God. But I want you to have a closer look at the Holy Spirit in this painting because he's showing you a deeper meaning. The Holy Spirit on the right-hand side there is pointing to something. He's pointing to a rectangular box on the front of that table. But he's pointing there for a reason because he wants the onlooker to pay attention to something. That rectangle that you see in that painting there, art historians have found glue residue in that area, only in that area of the painting. And what they have figured out, that at some point at the origin of that painting, as well as the years that would follow, there was a mirror, a mirror right in that spot there. Why a mirror, you're probably asking. And this is breathtaking, breathtaking to think about. It's there because at the table of God's three fullness, there is room for a fourth. Hmm. <laughs> there is room for a, th for a fourth. You, the onlooker, is invited into the painting as a united participant with God himself with the king of all of creation. It is God pointing to you the place where you belong. It is God inviting you to be connected in a valued, loving, honouring relationship with Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You see, at the heart of the Christian faith, is not a God who is some distant ruler disconnected from his creation. We don't worship a God who is some unknown force out there somewhere that you cannot know personally or interact with. No, he is a king who searches you out, chooses you, and almost like adopts you into his own royal family of heaven and invites you to sit with him. At his table of honour. Author Richard Raw, in his great book, The Divine Dance, writes about this painting. And he says this, This invitation to share at the divine table is probably the first biblical hint of what we would eventually call salvation. Jesus bringing you to his table to save you from the shame of your past to release you and set you free from the curse of sin and to redeem you from the darkness that wants to keep you bound and stuck in the mud. Are you ready to take your place at the table? Are you willing to come close and look into that mirror for yourself and see your reflection as to where you belong? Please hear me carefully because what I'm about to show you on this screen is very important for you to understand. Your place at the king's table is not based on your own efforts to earn it. No, like Mephibosheth, your place at the table is solely based on the loving kindness of the king. 
And like Mephibosheth, you too have to make a choice to accept this invitation. To accept an invitation from the royal king of heaven to come and be at the table like one of his sons, like one of his daughters. And that's who you are. That's what Christianity is all about. It's not us surrendering lives to Jesus to become religious slaves. It is us saying yes to an invitation to belong to a family, to sit in heavenly places with the King. I'm talking to both Christians and non-Christians alike here. You see, even within the church, I meet people who live more like orphans than dearly loved sons and daughters. You see, what King David did for Mephibosheth is what Jesus still does for you and I today. That anyone that is willing to come and sit where he is, is welcomed with open arms. But he searched you out. You didn't search for him. He searched you out to show you loving kindness, to show you his goodness, to show you his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. And his redemptive love that lifts you out of the mud of shame and guilt and embarrassment and humiliation. Lifts you out of the mud of sin, gripping your life and ruling your actions. This is what Jesus has done for us. The King of Kings searched you out to bring you into what he has. He prayed, he paid the price that your sins demanded. Will you come and sit at the king's table? Will you abandon the life that was so familiar to you, that was so distant from where you really belong? It really is a call to any spiritual orphan to come home, to receive love, to receive a new beginning, to receive hope, to receive freedom from the past that wants to hold you hostage to its lies. In this moment, we're going to take some time to sing a song together as we worship God. And we're going to declare together that I am not an orphan anymore. I am not an orphan anymore. Pay attention to the lyrics in this song because it tells your story and my story. Let's worship our King. You think so much of me.
I love the bridge of that song. It, it relates perfectly to what this message is about. But I want to invite you again. Will you come to the King's table? To think that the royalty of heaven knows your name, looks at you with loving kindness, and has summoned you to be where he is. Sadly, this is not the God that the world understands to be. Sadly, over time, the church has painted a version of God that seems so distant, so untouchable, unreachable. Yet what this painting and what this story reminds us of is that it doesn't matter what you feel like or what the past has done to you. It doesn't matter whether or not you feel worthy of this or if you've lived apart from God your whole life. You see, when His love collides with your shame, with your sin, with your fear, with your excuses, with your disappointments, with your failures and mistakes, love wins. His love wins. See, none of those things define you anymore because the King of Heaven has said something different about you. This is royal adoption at its finest. It is a stranger becoming a friend. It is a pauper becoming a prince, a rebel becoming a royal, the orphan finding a home, the lost being found, and the prodigal being celebrated. Today, today is your day of coming to the king's table and finding home. As I pray for you, I believe that some of you are watching and in this moment, you are moved to accept this invitation that I've been offering to you. To come and look in the mirror, situated at the table of the King, so that you may see your reflection. And you may hear the voice of the one who loves you above all else. Welcome home. And welcome to my table. Dear friend, if you have not made that decision, why wait? Why go back to, to trying to work this out on your own when you can now step in and become like family to the royal king of heaven? Wow, it's no comparison, is it? And the invitation stands that if you're ready and willing to come to the table, the king is ready to receive you. On that day, Mephibosheth chose wisely. And on that day, not only was his life changed, but so was his son, Micah. Because from that day onward, they were in the royal city of Jerusalem. But also, the royal place right beside the king. Let me pray. King of heaven, you never cease to amaze us as to how you continually search out for those that are far from you. To search for the lost. To bring the pauper into a royal family to make him a prince. You never cease to amaze me, my God, at how you can forgive sin, no matter how bad it might feel or seem, that your loving kindness and your goodness can wash it all away. God, your grace and your mercy is so powerful that there is nothing in our past that can disqualify us from being recipients of your forgiving grace. And I pray for everyone right now watching, God, that if there is anyone 
that is being moved to step forward and see themselves in the mirror of fellowship, the mirror of family, that they will do so boldly and not hold back. I silence all the lies of shame, all the lies that are trying to keep people held back to where they once were. Today, I believe in faith, Lord God, that there are some people watching this and even perhaps watching it later on that are being brought into the royal courts of the King to be where he is. I thank you for their salvation. I thank you that today they said yes to the King. And I seal it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And if that's you, please email me. Please let us know either by a comment on this Facebook page or, or an email through our website. But on the end screen, you'll see my personal email and I'd love to hear from you. Just let us know that you've made that decision and we'll help you take the next step. God bless you guys. Have a great day at the King's Table and enjoy this coming week unpacking this for your own life. Make it count. Don't let this moment slip away. You've been invited to the King's Table. Come, eat and enjoy His presence. I seal it all now in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love you guys. We'll see you during the week.